The Monitor 28 was part of the test equipment used to calibrate and fault find the H2S radar system. The H2S produced a PPI or plan position indicator display on a gather ray tube on the ground area over which the aircraft was flying. By comparing this information to a map, it was possible for the operator to identify certain features such as coastlines, rivers, built up areas, and large man made structures. So you can see here this system was complex, two display units being shown in green whereas the rest of the system being in tan, second green unit being a tail radar feature called fish pond to check the aircraft coming behind it. I've managed to find some useful information on some of the dedicated test equipment used for the H2S radar system. First we have the test set 202, used to generate calibration pips and markers. Signal generator 47, RF output between 9 and 9.2 centimeters using a CV67 klystron. Cable tester 209, used for testing the continuity and insulation of cables. Test set 205, lining up the TR3555 transmitter. And lastly, the wave meter W1310, which was typically used for tuning the Lucero transmitter and receiver. I can find no detailed information on the test set 83 and 85, both of which are used for measuring the magnetron output, or the Cambridge flux meter used for measuring the field strength of the magnetron magnets. Lastly, the Monitor 28 is essentially a very useful oscilloscope, geared up to be used to check specific H2S waveforms, voltage amplitudes, and pulse repetition frequencies, etc. So, this is our Monitor 28. Um, it normally does have a case, but as I've just been repairing it, I thought it was far better and more interesting to put in the video you've actually seen what the thing looks like inside. Not a particularly complex circuit as you can see. Um, it's just the valves along here, there's another one here and there's the HD rectifier on here. It's also a couple of diodes, um, BR92s. Um, power supply is interesting because we've obviously adapted it to run 240 volts but it does require Quite a few, I say a few transformers. There's two here and there's two underneath as well. If I turn this up the other way, we'll have an idea of what's on the underside. Bear in mind this was rebuilt as a completely blank chassis, so there's quite a lot of wiring involved. Yes, these are the other two transformers we need, making a total of four. This, of course, is the uh, VU120, the EHT rectifier typical COSA valve with a very intricate insides there. Big capacitors once again for the, the EHT and the smoothing choke for the HT. Nothing else on this side. Here's a better look at the underside of the chassis. You can see most of the wiring on it and the transformers over this. It's the smoothing choke. That's for the HT here so it's not, not another transformer strictly speaking. Notice there's a lot of big capacitors around. Um, big thick wires. The EHT on this is over 2000 volts, so it's one of those things that one wants to be a bit careful about if you're going to rebuild it um, as per the diagram. There is also, believe it or not, there is an output on the front panel here for the 2000 volts. Um, although in the manual it says there's currently nothing that is actually going to use this on the H2S test, so that's interesting. So they put it there, but they never used it, and that's hence these. Uh, big thick wires you see all over the place. Whilst the circuit itself is not particularly complex I would say, there's a lot of switching involved um, with the, the different settings for the time base and the input as you can see here. There's quite a lot of wires involved. Quick through run through of the uh, controls on the front panel. Some of the knobs are not original because I'm afraid this came out without any knobs at all so I've had to obtain what I have. Um, from outside sources. Um, power input here, the INT input here is directly through the diode into the Y amp. We have the time base settings, there's the variable and there's one, two, three, four other settings which are specific. These are, this is where it becomes a little bit um, not terribly useful to use as a um, uh, standalone oscilloscope for test test purposes on the bench. I personally wouldn't use it. Um, focus, brightness, we have the, the variable time base setting here that's adjustable. This is the Y adjustment which is used in conjunction with the meter. We'll talk about it in a minute. And this is the X. Then you have the input here, the ordinary input, and the um, trigger. Here we have the input settings are somewhat different again. 
we have four input settings that go through the amplifier. There's another one that goes from here, which is through the diode, and the other one which goes straight to the Y amp. The um, input also comes out on this terminal as here. For some reason, they've decided to bring it down to here. Just the terminal. And of course, that's just the earth. Um, the meter said works in conjunction with the Y amp. This is the um, bit we were talking about just now. This uh, cap here covers a very safe 2000 volts. So perhaps we won't take that off when we're actually running it. As is a video, I thought it might be an idea to actually show it working to give some idea of how the controls interact, etc. Um, interestingly, whilst it's good to keep the unit as much original, the downside I found is it's not terribly useful in its original form. By that I mean it wouldn't make a very useful test uh, equipment, shall we say, for general uses as the settings are all geared towards specifics relating to the H2S radar set. So, if we turn him on now, um, what I've done is attached an oscillator, it's running at about 20k. Um, when we see it up on the screen I'll explain a bit about that, the, the settings here. Something should happen. Oh yes, we have left off. This is the time base fine. This is the time base setting down here. There are five settings as I've already said. Um, unfortunately all of these are triggered settings. So you have to have a trigger. This is the only one that free runs. And this is the, see the trigger. It's not particularly effective. It works but they say it's actually so that it doesn't um, deform the waveform at all when you trigger it hard. Well, yeah, fair enough. Um, there's other. Th there's a time base um, start and stop one. This is more working with the with the other other settings here. So other than that, there's just the input here. The input. So one of these looks like it's overloading there. Um, then there's a straight in through the with no no Y amp at all, and then here is coming in through the socket here which goes in through a diode. I haven't actually included the diode, it's a VR92 because I didn't have to have one I thought I'm never going to use it. So it's all in conjunction with, with the other settings. So that's that's about how it works. Now interesting enough, the, this is the calibrated Y-shift because it's used in conjunction with the meter. Now there's supposed to be a graticule and there isn't a graticule. I don't know where it is and I can't find a picture of one um, as you'll see with the, the meter. As we move it up and down we could actually measure it by obviously using the graticule and there's a method described in the manual how you, how you do it. Um, it says that if I adjust the frequency of the um, oscillator up a bit that's 30k but unfortunately it doesn't really it's a bit limiting because that's what it does and it'll run up to about 100k but all in all it's not actually a very useful thing if you were going to use it on the test bench. In fact, as I say, it's, there's not a lot you can do with it. One last test. Um, this is actually showing us using it for something um, useful. When we demonstrate the equipment, when we have um, put all the equipment out at, at one of the events, it's nice to actually have it doing something rather than simply showing a, a sine wave. So this is using obviously the trigger and the input to it. And this is what comes up on the um, variable scale here. And what, what all we're simply doing, the demonstration is, is, is I'm generating a, a waveform to show an IFF, identification friend or foe, um, that expands on the size of the pulse coming back um, to show it on the radar screen. Um, so if we now go to the, these are the, the fixed settings and you can see what we actually did here. So if we move that, that's the X shift obviously there. Simply showing the extension of the pulse. This is just a, a basic simple idea just to give it something to do. And of course the Y shift moves up and down. Um, not a lot else we can say about it. I, I think it's, uh, if I was going to do this again, I think I'd probably do the same thing if I was going to rebuild it like this to make it sort of pretty much original. But I have to say if one was going to build one um, to turn it into an oscilloscope to actually use it, I, I think I'd, 
I'd seriously wonder about changing some of these settings to actually make it more usable because as it is it's, it's not exactly terribly usable like this. It's fine for what we're doing, demo of IFF Pulse, great, but other than that that's about all it does. Anyway, hopefully that's given some ideas for anybody thinking of rebuilding one of these if you come across it. Thanks for watching.